Hello world, I am Swarup Vaidyanath, Product Marketing Engineer at Wurth Electronics, based out of Plano, Texas. Today, we will be discussing about benefits of secondary site control in a power supply design. This 20 minute presentation was selected to be, pre to be presented in an industrial session at APEC 2020 that was supposed to be held. Four topics. The first one is defining the problem statement. The second one are the challenges faced to achieve secondary site control. The third is the integrated magnetics concept. Finally, the fourth one is the benefits of secondary site control. Over to Tom. Okay, my name is Thomas Quigley. I work for Microchip Technologies Incorporated. My office is in Vestal, New York. Uh, my title is uh, Staff Architect. I work for uh, APID, which is our analog, uh, analog Products and Interface Division. Uh, and we specialize in products for power in our group. Okay, so the, uh, the agenda for this is uh, four parts. Uh, Basically, uh, the benefits of, of, of uh, secondary side control, what are we trying to achieve? That's the problem statement. Uh, the challenges in order to achieve secondary side control. Um, we're gonna talk about a concept that uh, Microchip and uh, Worth are, uh, are co-developing, something called the integrated magnetic concept. And then at the end, we'll, write, we'll get right down to uh, all the benefits that we hope to achieve. So on to the problem statement. Uh, basically, when you uh, when you when you purchase a power supply controller, it, we have uh, the, the power supply controller has typical features. One part is called the compensator, and the compensator includes a precision reference, a voltage error amplifier and a compensation network. So basically, it's uh, the we're looking at the volt output voltage of the power supply, comparing it to a reference. The voltage error amplifier uh, creates an error uh, voltage for, to be processed by the uh, converter. And the compensation network says how fast this all responds for stability. And the compensation network could be um, internal to the device, or sometimes it's set by external components. Another part of the controller is called the modulator. And the elements of the modulator are uh, current sense. We have to sense the current uh, flowing in the primary of the transformer. Um, and when you turn on the MOSFET switch, uh, usually there's a spike involved. So what happens is there's something called leading edge blanking. And so that allows us to ignore that turn on spike and then monitor the current. Pretty standard for controllers. Uh, there's the PWM comparator. So what that's doing is looking at the actual current we're measuring in the transformer primary against the reference, which is the output of that voltage error amplifier in the previous slide. We have to have a clock, and that clock sets the switching frequency for the power supply. There's PWM logic, um, and that uh, is the uh, set reset functions of the uh, of the on and off time uh, of the uh, of the modulator. It can have other things uh, that for enable and disable, uh, or it can have steering of the gate drivers compared if you have multiple gate drivers. And then there's the gate driver itself, which is equipped to drive uh, power MOSFETs. Uh, also, there's other features. And they, they vary depending on what uh, power supply controller you're, you're uh, purchasing. But typically, uh, you end up with a voltage regulator, a high voltage regulator. Uh, usually, these controllers are powered, at least initially, off the rectified AC line. And then that creates a voltage, voltage that's usable by the IC. 
And then you have to have references and biases uh, for the controller and just to be able to power the IC and circuitry on the primary side of the power supply. Uh, there's something called under voltage lockout. And that says that the voltage to the gate driver is high enough uh, so that the gate, of, so the MOSFET can be properly driven. And over temperature protection, that's a typical feature. Uh, we will stop driving the power supply if the controller IC gets too hot. So this is a typical application. What I'm showing is an, uh, a flyback converter. And I show that uh, on the AC line, uh, line, line side of the power supply, the left side, I show the controller drive, you know, and it's looking at the uh, MOSFET. And then on the secondary side, there's the application. Typically, the load uh, that we're powering by the power supply contains a microcontroller unit. Uh, so that's always part of the load. So the load is whatever the application is that needs to be powered and the microcontroller that actually controls the application. So you have, in most typical cases, a, a microcontroller, that but it doesn't really have easy access to the primary side controller. Uh, the primary side controller is used to either regulate secondary side output voltage or current. But the primary side controller can't easily measure the output voltage and current. It must infer the output voltage current by looking at characteristics transferred through the transformer. So this is a modification to that flyback circuitry that shows some additional circuitry to help uh, improve the regulation accuracy of the output voltage in this case. So what we're doing is uh, it's typically uh, a circuit that essentially you have moved the compensator over to the secondary side. So now that error amplifier and reference are all located on the secondary side and it creates that error voltage, the, the error of the output voltage compared to the reference. And now it has to get that information back over to the primary side. And typically it does that using an optocoupler that's operating linearly. So the location of the optocoupler is right in between the compensator and the modulator, all right? And so that's another gain stage to the overall loop closure of the power supply. And the optocoupler itself has gain, and that's called a current transfer ratio. And that's in, or CTR. CTR has a lot of variance, both in production tolerances and aging. So when you go ahead and try to optimize your power supply design, you actually have to take in the CTR factor and you have to, you know, look at it with time and tolerance. And, actually, and it, it, it keeps you from actually optimizing the compensation network or, you know, the loop closing uh, it's not as optimal as it could be if you didn't have to deal with this optocoupler CTR. So, so that's what so those, that's the problems we're trying to achieve. We have a we have a a controller on the primary power supply that has a, a number of features. On the secondary side, you're usually powering a microcontroller, which is actually a controller of a pretty extraordinary power these days and you really can't use it together, they're separated. And by the way, you have to be able to talk from the secondary side to the primary side through a linear optocoupler, which is, doesn't give us the optimal loop performance. So what do we gotta do to try to achieve secondary side control and tackle those problems? So even though most controller functions are now once you have the secondary side control, and that secondary side control now has the ability to directly measure the output voltage and current. It doesn't have to infer it through a transformer. 
it's 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 on the secondary and it can look direct, directly at the output voltage and currents and make very accurate measurements right but still some key obstacles are over overcome the power supply has to be able to start up so when the ac line is applied to the power supply the primary gets energized but it actually has to switch the transformer to develop voltage on the secondary side so the secondary side controller can become active and then the primary the primary side has the, the mosfet switching device you have to be able to command it so now from the secondary side control we have to be able to command the primary side mosfet then you have to know how much current is flowing in the primary uh, of the transformer and through the mosfet and you have to be able to control that current that's flowing through the transformer primary and if you have something on the primary side, it also has to protect against a case where the secondary side controller is not working correctly. So for now, let's say we still need a device on the primary side, all right? It, we don't wanna compete with the, with the control capability of the microcontroller on the secondary side, but we still need to have certain functions on the primary side. So we're gonna call this an auxiliary controller. We'll, the, the, micro, the microcontroller is really your primary controller, but we do need like an auxiliary type control on the, on the primary side. And its tasks are to have that high voltage regulator. So off the rectified AC line, it can get powered up. It has the ability to drive the MOSFET, the gate driver. It has the ability to self-drive that gate driver. Right. And, and, and so that's a way to get things started, develop voltage on the secondary side. So the secondary side controller uh, becomes alive and active. And when, it, when the secondary side controller is active, then this auxiliary controller has to accept the PWM commands from the secondary side controller and essentially stop controlling the gate, the gate itself, but listen to the secondary side controller. And then we have to provide some basic protections in case uh, the secondary side controller is not working correctly. Uh, on the secondary side, uh, that the secondary side controller there, it, it needs to monitor the secondary, uh, the winding on the secondary, uh, the transformer secondary winding voltage. That's the way it can infer what the input voltage is to the converter. And that's useful for something called input under voltage lockout which is a function saying that if the input voltage, the AC line gets too low, it won't allow the power supply to operate because then it draws too much current, possibly blow a fuse or something like this. Also, the controller, if it knows what the input voltage is to the converter and it knows the primary magnetization inductance of the transformer, it can actually model the current ramp. So, it, so we can do peak current mode control with the benefits of feed forward from the secondary side by knowing what the input voltage is through the secondary winding. Right? And at the same time, uh, we have it, the additional production that the auxiliary controller provides. So one other challenge that we have for secondary side control is that we have to get the PWM command over from the secondary side control to the auxiliary controller, right? So, the benefit of this is, is that uh, we don't have to use an optocoupler in a linear range. We can use another device that actually puts through the actual PWM signal itself. So it's kind of like a digital signal, right? And, and because its location now is outside the loop of the modulator and uh, the compensator, it doesn't add a gain, a variable gain stage to the overall loop compensation. It's, it's neutral. So that's a, that's a big gain. So we don't have to worry about that like, like a linear optocoupler. And what we wanna do is make our primary uh, controller be uh, compatible with different kind of isolation devices. But uh, together with, uh, with Worth, we're looking at a, uh, an alternative solution uh, that's called the integrated magnetic to give uh, the user an additional option for this isolator. Thanks, Tom.
The integrated magnetic concept is unique as it has the ability to transfer both signal and power using the same transformer. The signal winding can work bidirectional and is wound on the outer core legs of the transformer. As shown in the figure, the blue wire indicates the signal winding that is wound on the outer core legs of the actual transformer, as shown in the left figure. The figure on the right shows the power windings as well. As we are dealing with a flyback transformer, there is a gap in the center leg to store energy. This slide shows the flux path for the power windings in red. The idea is that the signal windings are split evenly on the outer windings and the polarities are such that they buck or null the power winding flux. The core gap is a factor in deciding the flyback transformer's primary inductance. And uh, the core gap is based upon the inductance, turns, and primary peak current. This slide shows the flux path for the signal winding in red. The signal windings are again split evenly and their polarities are such that they are additive for the signal winding flux. There is no gap in the signal winding flux path for higher permeability. This slide shows the different windings used in this uh, integrated magnetic transformer. This 15 watt transformer was built using an EE2513 package. The primary windings taking the offline input voltage of 120 to 375 VDC are 2, 4, and 3, 5. There are two bias windings, namely 6, 7, and 8, 9. The output secondary windings, uh, which are 13, 14, and 10, 11, uh, providing the 5 volt at 3 amps, uh, as shown in the figure as well. In addition to these power windings, there are signal windings wound on the outer core legs of the transformer. These signal windings help in providing the feedback from the secondary side to the primary side of the circuit. The EE2513 package has an extended rail to meet the creepage and clearance distances mentioned in the safety standard IEC60950 and also meets reinforced insulation. The inductance is set to 1 millihenry with gap, and the saturation current is at 1.2 amps. This slide shows the construction diagram of the transformer. We split the primary turns and start off by winding the uh, half primary, followed by the 20 volt 3 milliamp bias winding followed by the 5 volt 3 amp secondary, followed by the 12 volt 80 milliamp bias winding, and completing it by winding the remaining half primary winding. We use triple insulated wires on the uh, secondary windings. This is done for two reasons. First is to keep the cost low, as there are fewer secondary turns. Second is to reduce the overall bobbin fill rate. The signal windings are wrapped uh, around the outside legs of the cores, and there are layers of tape in between every winding, and the entire transformer is also varnished. Overall, this integrated magnetic concept can help in eliminating the optocoupler and provides the means to control both the signal and power communications across the safety isolation barrier in an offline power supply. In our case, the PWM output of the secondary side controller is sent across the isolation barrier using the signal windings of the transformer to command the auxiliary controller. Thanks, and over to Tom. Okay. Okay, we'll go on to our last section of our presentation where we actually describe the benefits of secondary side control.
So we're going to show a typical application where we can really benefit uh, from having a secondary side controller and with its microcontroller resources. A secondary side controller could be analog, digital, or an analog, well, analog digital hybrid in design. And the secondary side controller could be its own microcontroller or it can make use of the application that's under power by the power supply. We can use its microcontroller. And so if you have some extra resources within the application's microcontroller, you can dedicate it to controlling the power supply that provides its power. Many, if not all the features of the secondary side controller can be programmed, right? And there's two ways to look at programming. You can, set up the power supply the way you want it and 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 set it all up and then forget it which which means that every time the power supply becomes energized uh the the programmable information is burned in and all the settings are 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 are, are loaded in at, at boot up there's something called adaptive control where we actually have software running in the secondary side controller which means that Whatever you set up for the power supply initially for all its operating parameters, those operating parameters can be can be can vary as the power supply is operated through its line load range or other considerations in order in order to optimize the power supply's performance. So that's what adaptive control means. Like a simple example of that is, is that if you go to a light load, you might want to be able to lower the switching frequency that lowers some of the switching losses in the, in, the, in the MOSFET. There's all kinds of things that you can do with adaptive control to optimize your power supply. Once you have a secondary side controller uh, and, and, its, and, and, and its programmable features. The secondary side controller, as we mentioned before, it directly monitors and regulates the output voltage uh, and its current. You, you, you can uh, so those th all those characteristics can be modified. Uh, the, the regulation levels can be adjusted. So if you want to raise the output voltage a little bit to, to make up for line drop, you can do that. And, or you can, or say you have a power supply that in one application, you know, it, it, you want the output to be five volts, but in another application you want it to be five point one volts. It's a software adjustment. You can adjust protection levels like under voltage lockout and over voltage lockout. You can adjust those levels and persistence. Persistence means how, you know, uh, a little bit of filtering time so that it doesn't have a lot of noise sensitivity. Those things can be adjustable. Uh, you can adjust your current limit characteristics. You can decide uh, where you want to go in the current limit. Uh, do you want to uh, fold back the current? You want to have some uh, I squared T type of characteristics. All those can be programmable. And in some cases, the loop compensation may be programmable too. So under different light, load conditions, you can actually change the way that you've compensated the, mod, uh, the, the compensator. Uh, its compensation network can be adjusted to optimize the loop bandwidth for a particular operating condition. Uh, the secondary side controller has the ability to uh, to also directly drive a synchronous rectifier, which is a way of really increasing the efficiency of a power supply by putting a MOSFET across the output rectifier. This can give the ability for the secondary side controller to operate the flyback converter in either a fixed frequency mode or in a quasi frequency mode and be able to switch from one mode to, to the other. Uh, for instance, you could be quasi-resident mode uh, at, at high load conditions, and as you go to lighter load conditions, if you don't want the frequency to go too high, then you can switch to a fixed frequency uh, operation. Uh, you can control how long the synchronous rectifier stays on after the current in the secondary winding falls to zero. You can actually let it reverse direction in the transformer and then turn off the uh, synchronous rectifier and turn on the primary side MOSFET to give you some zero voltage switching capability. Also, you can do things called uh, valley count. 
which is something they do for quasi-resonant uh, control. What that says is that you're looking at the post-conduction ring on the secondary winding of the transformer, and you time when you turn on the primary MOSFET, depending on how many valleys of that ring you count. And what that does, that extends the operating range, uh, line and load range that you could be in quasi-resonant mode and get the benefits of quasi-resonant control. The secondary side controller can act as a power supply supervisor. So if you have multiple outputs, uh, you can, and those multiple outputs can either be uh, to deliver power to a load either by a power delivery switch or through some kind of post regulator, whether it's linear or switching post regulator. Uh, you can turn on and off these various output channels. You can sequence the on and off. Uh, when the power supply first turns on, you can sequence uh, the different channels of power supplies in a particular order. If you're gonna turn things off, you can turn off the different channels of output, output power in some kind of sequence. Uh, a lot of these devices now, uh, the power delivery switch and uh, some, uh, post regulators have, uh, you could communicate to them, maybe through I squared C or some other discrete connections. And since your secondary side controller could be, you know, has a microcontroller in it, you can take advantage of those things. Like a power delivery switch, you may be able to, you know, turn, first of all, not, not only turn on and off the switch, but you can set its protection levels and maybe able to get some other data back from that power delivery switch. So all that's all that is, that making exploiting that microcontroller gives you a lot of information about how your power supply is working. And uh, the secondary side controller can act as a system level controller. So so it can it it can talk to a higher level processor in a system. It could be the application if the power supply has its own microcontroller. The power supply could be embedded in a system where there's a system level controller. And this gives you the, the system level control availability to know what's going on within the power supply that could be interpreted as diagnostics. You get an idea exactly what the power supply is doing. And also the system level controller can also, through adaptive control, optimize the power supply because now I have this ability. This is all the benefits of secondary side control when you have a microcontroller on the secondary side and, 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 you, and, now, and it's available to, to uh, systems on the secondary side where all I have to do is send a PWM signal to the auxiliary controller once it starts up. So thank you for listening to our presentation.